Hi, welcome to Instrumental Analysis. I'm Vicki Colvin. In this week, we're really covering spectroscopy, and the purpose of this mini lecture is to talk about the y-axis, which is a measure of how much light is interacting with the samples. And you typically measure that for UV vis in terms of absorbance, and in infrared spectroscopy, you measure it in terms of transmittance. And the purpose of this lecture is really to take you through the quantitative part of the y-axis. So in UV vis, we have pretty colors. One of the nice things about doing optical absorption is you typically are working with samples that are purple or blue or yellow, and that's kind of nice. It's usually very pretty. But to really apply an optical absorption technique to a liquid solution, first of all, the samples have to be clear. If you have something muddy or milky, it's not going to work because light's going to get scattered by the particles in the sample rather than traversing through it and just getting absorbed. And scattering is very different than absorption. Now. The other thing that you'll typically notice is that for a lot of visible spectroscopy, you'll be able to detect the color with your eye, as you can see in these solutions. And your eye is a kind of photo detector. So in a funny way, when you observe the light of a solution, you're actually, in your own way, doing a type of UV vis spectroscopy. But remember, I'm just going to go over again, and we talked about a little bit of atomic spectroscopy, but it's more important here, that what you see is not the absorption wavelength. So I found this really great table, and I wanted to make sure I shared it with you, because it really tells you what you see for what you get absorbed. And just to go over those final pictures, violet then would be absorbing at 570, and I'm calling this more of a blue. Anyhow, that's going to be at 590. You can sort of see how it works. So just the appearance of a solution can tell you something about where the lambda max, or where that peak absorption might be for what is often a pretty big blobby kind of peak. Now, if you're doing quantitative analysis and absorption spectroscopy, you're going to be looking at the passage of light, usually through a vial containing your samples. And, and we're really talking not so much about gas phase absorption spectroscopy. We're really focused more on liquids here, but a lot of the same principles hold. So in the quantitative analysis here, you can sort of see how we think about optical absorption. So in this case, you're going to have a certain incident power on a sample. Some of it will be absorbed, and then you're going to have power coming out. Incidence called P0, what comes out is called P, kind of convention. Anyhow, the transmittance is the amount coming out divided by P0. So if you have a transmittance of 100%, your sample didn't absorb anything. P is equal to P0. If you have a transmittance of only 10%, your sample absorbed 90% of the light. So transmittance can be in percent or it can be a fraction. Depends. And usually if it's T percent, it's obviously percent. Now for absorption, it's a little bit different. It's log P0 over P. I always write it as minus log P over P0 personally, but you get the idea. It's the log of the transmittance. And so when you have a really high transmittance, you're going to have a really low absorption. Conversely, if you have a high absorption, let's say an absorption of 4, only 10 to the minus 4 photons are going to be getting through your sample. So transmittance will range from 0 to 1, and near 1, there's not a lot of absorption. Absorbances will range 0 to 4. And you really don't want to operate in that big of range because at four, as I said, there are very, very, very few photons that are getting through your sample. It's too black. So you want to try to operate. The optimal is about 0.3 to 0.8 in terms of absorbance because you end up taking enough photons out, you can detect the sample, but not so many photons that you have to resort to something crazy like photon counting to actually measure your signal. Now, there's a lot, two different points of this slide. The first point is what's shown over here to the left, which is that when you're collecting data in absorption spectroscopy, you have to realize, like I said with the milk, that the sample itself can actually reduce the power going through it through processes that have nothing to do with absorption. You can get scattering. You can get reflection losses. So it's really important when you measure absorption. And notice here that I've inverted it because I like it better as P over P0. And so I put the minus there that you always, always, P0 is not measured before you put it through the sample in really good spectrometers. It's measured in a separate path <coughs> with a solvent. And that way you can actually get a really good absorbance measurement. So in the future, you always have to run a blank or simultaneously run a blank next to your sample. And I'll use that when I use P0, know that I mean you're running a blank solvent with not your stuff in it, because that's going to control and take out a lot of these factors that can really mess up your measurement. So formal Beer's law then says that absorbance defined that way is going to be proportional to the concentration of the sample. It's kind of obvious. The more stuff you have in the sample, the more it's going to absorb. The absorbance is also proportional to the path length. 
So the longer the sample path, also the more absorbance. And that also kind of makes sense. If you have a really thick piece of blue glass, your world is going to look really blue, or if it's a very thin sheet, it's only going to slightly modify your perception of the world. And then this final constant is called the molar absorptivity. It's a unit that's specific to that particular transition for that particular molecule. It's telling you how good is that molecule at absorbing that frequency of light. So absorbance is not a number for the whole spectrum. Remember, absorbance is plotted for every wavelength. There's a different absorbance. And so the molar absorptivity is generally given at the peak maximum. And that's going to be telling you a lot about how effective the absorption is. A really high molar absorptivity means you absorb a lot. A little small one means you don't absorb much at all <coughs> per amount of sample. There's another less specific unit that's just called absorptivity, and it has versatile units. So a note about units. Absorptivities have to cancel. So when you use molar absorptivity, it's going to have inverse molarity to cancel the concentration units and inverse centimeters to, to cancel the path length. So molarity and centimeters are just the common way that the world defines molar absorptivity or epsilon. But absorptivity broadly stated without molar in front of it could mean a thousand different units. And then the units you apply would be given by the circumstances that you were doing the measurement. So let's look a little bit about transitioning then from absorbance to transmittance and just make really sure you're really clear on how to do that. So I want you to take a look at this Excel sheet over here and you can try these questions on your own. They're really the simple application of a log function. Anyhow. For the first one, absorbance is minus log t over t0. So we were given absorbance, so it's just 10 to the minus 0.1, and that gives you 0.794 or 79.4. In this other case, we're going the other way. We're just plugging that into the formula, and we get an absorbance of 0.3. And I'll just point out an absorbance of 0.3 is like the best case for measuring an optical absorption spectrum because you're taking away exactly half the light. So you have plenty of photons to detect, but you've also interacted with plenty of photons as well. So it's kind of an optimal place to be in terms of where you want to optimize in terms of concentrations to really detect what you're interested in. So let's look at Beer's Law in action. Beer's Law tells us as we change concentration, a peak is, we're going to change the spectrum. And so here you see potassium permanganate, and I've drawn a line over one of its lambda maxes. You can often have more than one lambda max. And in fact, when we did HPLC, you kind of had to pick a wavelength in some really cheap detectors. And so here, this particular question is asking for molar absorptivity, but they're asking for it at around 525, which is where I've dropped the line. Now, what I did is I went and I estimated the absorbance at each of these different ppm concentrations. And then I applied Beer's Law. I did it using an Excel sheet. So here are my results. I took a path length of a centimeter, and I took the atomic weight of manganese. It turns out the molecular weight of potassium per, per manganate is not relevant to this question. So the first thing I had to do, remember they're asking for molar absorptivity, so you have to convert everything to molar. Then what I did is I looked at delta A. Delta A is the change in absorbance rather than the net absorbance of the sample. Kind of depends on how you did your blank. Traditionally, you would use call it delta A. In this case, since I was really estimating, I didn't try to draw a baseline here. I just took it from this point to that point. And these values are my estimated, completely estimated values for this data set. Then what I did is I just defined epsilon as the absorption, which I have measured from this data set, divided by the concentration times the path length. And I get a variety of different epsilons, probably because I'm estimating, of course, the delta A, but at least they're in the right ballpark. And this is, in fact, the molar absorptivity for potassium permanganate. Just to summarize some of the quantitative terminology that we use today. So we have incident power and transmitted power. And you'll see those called a lot of different things. I'm actually more comfortable with it as I versus an I0 instead of P and P0. Uh, you see absorbance. You'll also see something called optical density, or OD, very common. Uh, path length, also a number of ways of talking about it. And the most range of definitions you find is in absorptivity and molar absorptivity. You can get it done in a lot of different kinds of units. And so if you really are trying to quantitate something, and you're looking at molar absorptivities in the literature, be really on the lookout for what units they're reported in. Because like I said, you can find a whole range of stuff out there. The last point to take home from this lecture is don't forget Beer's Law. Beer's Law is your friend when you want to quantitate the amount of something. And it's something we're going to use 
really frequently in analytical chemistry because often we do want to know exactly how much of a substance we have and this is a really simple way of getting at that. You have a nice optical absorption spectrum and you can look up the molar absorptivity, you can calculate it. You can also use it through calibration just like we did in atomic spectroscopy to calculate unknowns. And in fact we relied on Beer's Law when we did atomic spectroscopy. So with that I've given you an introduction to the kind of quantitative aspects of optical spectroscopy. Thanks so much and see you next time.